Coming up on Digital Music Trends 227 on the 8th of April 2015, can Meerkat and Periscope be of use to artists? More on Tidal, Samsung and Omniphone, SeatGeek closes a $62 million round, the Concord Bicycle Group acquires Vanguard and Sugar Hill, and I catch up with Smule on the latest news at the company. This week's show is brought to you by Gramophone, a small device that can turn your traditional sound system into a Wi-Fi music player. The Gramophone relies on your home Wi-Fi rather than on Bluetooth, which allows for higher sound quality. You can send your music to the Gramophone right from the Spotify app. And from that moment, the device will bypass your phone and stream directly from the Spotify servers, which means that your phone won't run out of charge and you'll be able to receive notifications and calls without interrupting your music experience. We thank them for the support of Digital Music Trends. Check out the website on gramophone.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linali and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And the show can be downloaded as a podcast, either as an audio file or as a video file. So in case you'd like to take it with you, uh, do and go, go and check out one of the uh, podcast apps, which can be the, the uh, podcast app built into iOS 8, or you can download Downcast or, or a bunch of different apps for Android. Uh, and and uh, you can take the show with you instead of just streaming it on, uh, on, uh, on demand services. And uh, this week, uh, it's a real pleasure Pleasure to welcome to the show Darren Hemmings, the founder of digital marketing agency Motive Unknown. So hi Darren and thanks for joining me. How's it going today? Hello, good, thanks. Sorry, I'm I'm in my office, so uh, yes, having to wear receptionist <laughs> headphones. Apologies. That, that is the excellent. Discreet in-ear ones would uh, would be a lot of use if they weren't in my house. Yeah, no, it's fine. I, I, I've so. given up on those a long time ago, and also I have uh, uh, people chopping down trees near my house so if you hear some very strange noises that's probably what it is and also joining me on the show today is a real pleasure to welcome back and Matthew Hahn who is running his own consultancy now working on strategy with a number of startups as well as uh, and he uh, held uh, uh, executive positions at Sony, Last.fm and Samsung to name a few so hi Matthew and thanks for joining us how's it going? Hey guys very 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 well it's a beautiful day here in London yeah it's nice absolutely gorgeous it's absolutely gorgeous and uh, uh, it would be nice to be outside actually uh, this uh, in, in, in the last few days but I was stuck I was stuck in the house and uh, so this week there's quite a few things uh, to, uh, to talk about I would leave Tidal to the second story just because uh, last week we opened with that and we spent uh, probably like uh, more than half the show talking about uh, Tidal so I wanted to do a little bit of an, a, a start with a little bit of an aside uh, talking about uh, the, those video streaming services uh, uh, since you you both worked with the uh, startups and, and you know you, you worked in, in strategy in, in different capacities so uh, uh, just uh, as a jump off point uh, Madonna yesterday attempted to ride uh, the latest phenomenon which is Meerkat and, and uh, the equivalent uh, app uh, uh, purchased by Twitter Periscope so she tried to do uh, some sort of a stream of her new video Ghost Town and pr- premiere it on uh, uh, Meerkat but the uh, 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 fans were uh, outraged when uh, at the time that she said uh, that the, the stream would be live there was a 500 error page and uh, a lot of people thought that Meerkat had crashed under the traffic of the video it turns out that actually there was something else that happened we don't really know wh- what it was but the founders of Meerkat actually posted that uh, their services is, is pretty steady uh, you know rock steady and, and they wouldn't have uh, failed under, under pr- the pressure so apparently that the stream was postponed and in fact Madonna postponed the stream to today so it's going to happen today uh, we'll report more on that next week if something goes wrong again but uh, you know the, the story itself is not that meaningful just because nothing really happened but it's more of a jump off point to talk about whether you think that uh, these services can become a tool for artists to do something what I- I'm not sure uh, Matthew uh, you know, uh, live performances for for music have never done particularly well as a as a video streaming event. I mean, you just don't see people talking about that. You you ask the Apple guys how the live broadcast of their of their festival goes, which is one of the best focused kind of things going out there, and it's not it's not a big deal for them. It's much more about the promotion and the industry recognition. So I don't see this as a strong um, thing for artists. To be honest with you. Um, Wrapped into Twitter as part of an artist's existing Twitter thing where you have some artists maybe just from time to time broadcasting, but I don't see it as a new revenue stream for them. I just see it as yet another arrow in the quiver. Yeah, yeah. Darren? I mean, I think from my side of it, it's. It, it, I think it would help a lot more if the service, you know, taking Madonna's kind of event as, as a case in point, didn't feel like it was quite such a sort of uh, egregious case of, bandwagon jumping really it's you know <laughs> yeah. you can kind of see you know you can sort of visually see the meeting happening you know someone says what can we do and let's put it on meerkat be amazing oh yeah you know, that's new that's uh, the kids capital t capital k love this let's let's do that um you know the, the, the people 
people ad- adopt these things, you know, you, you're either in or you're out. You know, if somebody's built a name on it and built a following, then then you have good reason to do things on there. But if you're just kind of doing it to to just be on that and appeal to the youth and all this kind of stuff, it, I think they can smell that kind of thing a mile away. And, you know, it's something I've been talking about quite a lot recently with friends of mine is the degree to which there's this kind of interesting um, paradox at the moment in that, people like me are trying to market to audiences using platforms where one can do marketing on a more of a paid level. So you sort of Facebook and Twitter and things like that. And you have alongside that a degree of social media engagement. But I think sometimes, you know, unless that's really well handled natively by the artist, it can just, again, look like kind of marketing with a capital M. And the problem is that a lot of, I think a lot of the action that happens now or the the, the high value stuff is happening on platforms that don't carry ads, most likely because they don't carry ads. And the minute you try and walk in there to sell to people on those platforms, you're uh, kind of making it marketing with a capital M again. You know, it's it's too heavy handed and it presents this, you know, schism in which we're trying to reach these people. But in, uh, in you know, the very efforts to reach them to some extent are, are, are undercutting the the credibility of the exercise if you like because it's spotted from a mile away as being too obviously a marketing exercise yeah yeah it, it's it's also interesting we don't quite know what to do with this thing yet i mean it's when telephones were first introduced and they took a long time to be introduced they originally envisioned them as as broadcast tools right someone was going you were going to pick up the phone and listen to a concert you were going to mm-hmm. do this and you know we just didn't know what to do with them so i suspect we're going to be in the same place with something like meerkat and periscope we don't quite know what they're good for yet and so we're trying things we've already done before we're trying to broadcast a concert we're trying to do something we've already it doesn't fit the medium yeah someone quite native to it will use it interestingly um, and, and maybe an artist, it may be another, you know, Stampy or, uh, uh, you know, or another vlogger, right? It could be somebody in those spaces who does something interesting with it. But I don't think broadcasting concerts is a great one or even, no. or even performances necessarily. It's not necessarily the right place for it. Yeah. It but it's like- interesting, isn't it? Because the, the immediacy of these formats, you know, the, the Meerkat and Periscope exist to be a, you know, I'm live streaming right now. And that jars with a kind of let's plan and execute a whole yeah. live event uh on the platform you know i think the yeah. stories the success stories that you'll see that will come from these will be people that used it in the spirit in which it was meant to be used which is you know, they you know skrillex will just choose to broadcast a set and everyone will flock to that you know and that people then like that because it's immediate and unplanned and it feels natural yeah and then you know that will build a much greater connection with an audience for those reasons but it's funny you know i just think at the moment you're kind of you know with these 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 platforms where immediacy and those sorts of things are coming along as being more valuable tools maybe or more valuable aspects um they just fundamentally go against, you know, the plan and execute strategy of marketing and things like that, where, Agreed. you know, I can't, I can't just decide at four o'clock on a Friday, let's do something with, with one of our artists, because there's a million people who have to approve it. Uh, you know, these things have to be planned and executed, but then that means that they're fundamentally not really going to work that well on a platform built around immediacy. Yeah. You know, if, if, if it's organic immediacy, you know, a very natural sense of like, hey, I've decided to do this thing right now, then... Um, Either you've got to be masterful at carrying it off and making it look like it was very unplanned and whatever else, uh, or you accept that it's it's going to be a little bit stinky because people will know just the degree to which you pre-planned it all. Yeah, you kind of you wonder if there's a, the opportunity for somebody to do something on an appointment basis, like, but it wouldn't it wouldn't be the artist necessarily, like something like you know, uh, we're going to meerkat all the prep for every gig, you know, so the sort of the green yeah. room or, or or the 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 uh, the changing rooms of of the of the artists sort of before they go on stage every night on mm. the tour or something like that or this the sound check maybe I I probably pay to watch Andrew WK do something off the cuff right I mean there are certain people who are just natural at this kind of medium yeah. and who can be off the cuff I I don't see uh, Madge as one of those people right I don't see her as <laughs> someone who is ready just to be uh, you know off the cuff I. You, Taylor Swift's not going to happen anytime soon. That girl plans everything down to the Martha Stewart level of, of detail. It's not going to happen with those guys. But yeah. mm-hmm. someone who's being really casual and already has that kind of off-the-cuff performance, I see it could be their medium. It could be like study Kabbalah with Madonna or uh, <laughs> <laughs> study yoga with Madonna. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> As if we haven't seen her in a leotard enough. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so... Um, 
you know, um, <laughs> moving on from from uh, Meerkat, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, the other thing, the, I guess, last thing I wanted to I wanted to say was that I, I never see that many people on Meerkat, like as far as broadcasting. So I, wa I my question is, is, is that because the and also on Periscope, but it doesn't look like it only shows me people that I know. It also shows other random people. So is it just not that many people broadcasting at any given time, or is it filtering them down at some, at some, at some in some way? I don't know if you've noticed that uh, either. Yeah. Of you. Well, personally, I've I've not used it because I'm an Android user. So, um, yeah. oh, I, my, neither of them are my, on there. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, right. I don't want to sound like the embedded, uh, you know, non-Apple guy, but you do kind of think these days the notion of not launching on, you know, certainly by numbers is the more dominant platform, I believe. Then, uh, yeah, I, I find that a bit odd. <laughs> you think, you know, if you're if you're uh, well backed and well funded and everything else, the notion that you just ignore Android in the short term strikes me as a very uh, bizarre strategy you know it'd be a bigger statement to land on both at the same time and particularly for Twitter where I think there's yeah. no excuse sorry I mean I think yeah. it makes no sense in terms of the fact that they're both free so it's not like you're trying to make money of it where, where obviously Apple uh, iOS is still the winner in terms of releasing an app there because you make more money on iOS that's just uh, sort of undisputed at, at this point but uh, the interesting thing the only thing I would think is whether there are development problems around the fact that it's a live stream and it seems to work really smoothly and whether the fact that there's they have to support a bunch of different hardware that all has different specs on cameras mm -hmm. and, and you know hardware cap capabilities means that they are worried about offering a subpar experience to Android users if they have to sort of compromise and hope that people have enough hardware to to make a run. Mm. Maybe. Maybe That's the only thing I can think of because the one thing that I found with Meerkat that I thought it worked really smoothly and broadcast looks pretty looks pretty good even on three three G, which means that they have to have a lot of compression and stuff going on in the background uh, to mm. make it work. But yeah, that, that's the only thing that I thought of in terms of uh, Android issues. Uh, but uh, and I actually I, I'm kind of thinking about I was contemplating the the new uh, Windows tablet. I don't know why I'm, I'm kind of being masochistic here, but uh, I, I'm finding myself not to use the, the iPad very much anymore. And I was <laughs> trying to figure out whether I should get a Chromebook or just get a Surface 3, one of the new ones. I don't know. Mm. It's total total tangent here. but I was, I was seeing some Microsoft people recently, and, and the Microsoft Surface tablet combination is, is, the, is the PC everybody wants. If you're a Windows user and that's your world, um, that's what people are looking for now. It seems to be the the laptop of choice, but I'm I'm not so sure. I'm a, I'm a Mac guy, so it's hard always to to tell what's what's uh, what's what's the state of the art there. But right, yeah. mm -hmm. right. Yeah, because I love the new MacBook, but it seems a bit of a ripoff in terms of specs. So uh, yeah. anyway, uh, we should move on to more more music news. And actually, uh, the, the uh, Madonna story is a good uh, is a good uh, offers a good segue because uh, it was kind of interesting that she uh, she's doing this Meerkat. Uh, uh, you know, exclusive because she is one of the artists that is uh, on board with Tidal. And so obviously uh, we've seen that this week Rihanna and Beyonce release uh, tracks exclusively on Tidal. Uh, Rihanna released a video and Beyonce released a track uh, for the anniversary of her wedding, I think, with Jay-Z. Uh, uh, and But Madonna decided to go with Meerkat, which is kind of a weird decision considering that she was on stage last week uh, uh, singing uh, the service's praises and, and it would have made sense to pre pre premiere the, the video on there. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk about on Tidal. Obviously last week we, we did a, a show that was uh, mostly on the negative side just because we talked a lot about the issues with the, with the service. Uh, uh, Billboard published the piece uh, just the day after the, the show uh, we, we uh, released the show where they sort of talk about the, the issues around the, the rollout and they, they tried to talk uh, to somebody called Vanya Schlogel who's the title's chief investment officer and chief industry li li liaison but the problem is, was that it was a lot of PR speech you know in, in the interview itself you know they tried to address some of the, the question marks and uh, uh, you know when uh, asked about you know whether it, this was a service for the one percent of musicians that are you know the richest ones in the world and uh, a way to make them richer uh, she answered uh, uh, you know I would say it's almost the reverse of that uh, and sort of went on to, to talk about the fact that no actually it's a service for everybody which it doesn't seem like it, it is the case right now uh, but uh, you know from, from your point of view how have you seen the conversation evolve uh, around Tidal from sort of the immediate backlash to sort of a week later have you seen any evolution around it or or, or around what people think of, of the service uh, uh, up to now uh, um, I mean, I think it feels like the conversation is evolving a, a, a little bit, but you know, it depends on on what level we're talking, really. I mean, uh, you know, there's there's one conversation within the music business, I think, to some extent, and then perhaps another one from outside of that, you know, yeah. among Joe Joe Public. Um, I mean, I think uh, you know Tim Ingham's site, Music Business Worldwide, kind of nailed it for me when he said that the Beyonce exclusive was kind of on youtube within about 
five minutes of going live on Tidal. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I must confess from where I sit, I feel like a, a strange collective madness has overcome everyone on this debate. It seems, you know, a really disproportionate level of strange conversations involving sort of slightly demonizing Spotify as if they have sort of something to answer to. And, yeah. and, and YouTube in the meantime is sort of not really... Like, I, I, I still, you know, I've said it on the Digest a couple of times already, but I, I just don't really understand how YouTube is not uh, a central part of this entire debate when everyone's moaning about free and freemium and, and everything else when, you know, as we are seeing, you know, they're, 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 they're sort of existing to undercut everyone else by way of the, the catalogue inevitably winding up on their platform. Now, admittedly, the, the, the exclusives from Tidal have all been getting pulled, but it's a bit of a whack-a-mole game such that you will still find it somewhere uh, on there because it just keeps getting uploaded again. So on the whole, I, I'm finding the whole thing a, a bit odd. You know, it's, it's sort of it's that thing where you, you're wondering how we've reached this point in the debate without... You know, it seems like sense has 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 been left to one side, and it's. Uh, I find it all quite odd. I have to say, you know, with you know, to me, I have to be honest. I mean, I think I, I read an interesting piece today from Helian Linville in the Guardian that was sort of suggesting that actually Tidal could be a great thing for songwriters, and that Jay Z's whole point is much more about the uh, the co-writers of songs, not just the performers and the artists and things like that. Uh, you know, I must confess that my knowledge around the songwriters and publishing world in general and what they're due and what they don't get and everything is pretty slim because it's not a world I have too much sure. involved with. So I'd rather cop to being rather ignorant on that than claim I've got a, a great comment to make. So if her points stand, and I'm sure they do, then they sound pretty good and valid. But unfortunately, I still don't see Tidal as anything other than shrewd investment on Jay-Z's part. And I said right from the start that, you know, he would buy it use the brand value to inflate the to invite the overall value of the company and then from there you know um flip it you know sell it to whomever be it a tech giant or someone that will pay to take them out of the race like apple uh you know anything like that and yeah. and uh and and that's it I, you know I, I just can't see it as anything other than that at this yeah. point it's yeah. it's a bit strange yeah Matthew, with uh, your product background, sort of, what, what, yeah, I, what, what I mean, as, as a pro, I mean, I, look, I've been around watching the Aspiro guys for a long time. It's not like they were brand new to the market. So yeah. this is much like you know, Beats used its leverage from Mog to um, to step up and then sell to Apple. The, I, it, there is a cynical look at this, the way that Darren's looking at it, which is to say that there is a, this is just a flip, and it, it certainly works. I mean, he's already up to the numbers he wanted to. If he sold it today, he'd, he'd do really, really well. But to me, that's all inside, and I'm trying to step back a little bit from it and, and not be cynical about it and say, well, what does the market look like for streaming right now? Are there room for more players in it? And the answer is yeah. I mean, certainly. There's, there's room for different takes on this space right now. Um, and I'm glad to see I am try to not be cynical about the artist side of this, right? I don't, I don't quite buy the, this is the first global platform owned by artists. Um, it's a bit of a bit of a hyperbole there, but it is nice to see some artists taking the reins of something that has been a business conversation, yeah. right? For the longest time, right? It's been an investment conversation. It's been a numbers conversation. It's been a VC conversation, you know? And I think it still is, but it's nice to have some artists injected, not the labels, not the uh, VC community, not the tech community. So, I welcome them to the mix because I think we're going to see some, hopefully we'll see something different and it's theirs to fuck up. I mean, to be honest with you, I think it's really theirs to, to, to make some decisions on. They've got to get some people in there and the Aspiro guys were good and are good. Yeah. So they need to keep building that up and, you know, and, and doing some development there. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm taking the long view on them. More players is good, not bad. For the market, I think Jay Z was very generous. He said, "Look, Spotify doesn't have to lose for us to do well in this." Yeah, and I think that's important to remember. You know, we can have more than one player in this service, more than one deal. More streaming services look. There's so many of them look alike at this stage, right? They have the same catalog, the same basic approach to how they just do discovery. I am looking for some innovation to come out of somebody, and more players are likely to come up with innovation than fewer. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, it's got a good point there, and, and uh, uh, you know, to that to that extent, we, uh, you know, 
we hope that there's going to be a lot of more successful uh, services coming up in the next few months. You know, where we're seeing the Apple service could uh, uh, could uh, change the ecosystem a little bit uh, if if they are successful uh, yeah. with with what they're trying to do. Uh, although we don't know much about it uh, yet, so we're going to have to see whether we uh, know more at WWDC in June uh, after the whole uh, Apple Watch uh, frenzy dies down and they have some more uh, time uh, to talk about something else. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, you're right. There there is a lot of room out there. Uh, Let's just hope that they are because everything happens so quickly. Like I said last week, you know, uh, I just hope that they can iron out some of the concepts that were at best shaky conceptually uh, 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 around the press release and around what their ethos is and around how they are planning to pay artists more money when there is no more money to be given out because most of these services are still, uh, quite frankly, operating at a loss. And so uh, th there's a lot of question marks still to be answered there, but uh, hopefully we'll, we're going to hear more in the next few months ar around that. Uh, as I said, uh, I would be really, really interested to hear if there was somebody bold enough to implement that other business model, which was to try and distribute the money that you would have mm. given to labels anyway to every to only to the artists that you listen to in that particular yeah way. i like that i'm interested in that so, one too i'm curious to see if someone else will pick that one up too so that'll be really interesting to see if uh, something comes of it because it was it was a spire that was behind sort of that study and that gave yeah. all the data to the university that did it but obviously you know we're talking about a very different type of ecosystem now where they are mm -hmm. at especially as they're already international and they're in a bunch of different countries it would be a pain to redo the deals based on those sort of uh, one, one would assume though that the, the major labels must have that button down in a manner that it's a no-go yeah probably which, you know which is yeah. is it would 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 be entirely sort of uh not right but, <laughs> right but understandable in the in the in the in the sense that they are the largest players and therefore yeah. it's like it's white we, we, we've been making some big right. assumptions about what economics have to be for this mostly based on large valuations right i mean we've been yeah. saying spotify is not going to make any money till they hit a certain level and and and, and, get, and their investors are poured so much and they got to get stuff back out whereas i'm kind of interested to see what happens with the platform from a more um band sub, you know a label support and, and, and artist support perspective right so if these guys don't focus on making a huge amount of money back out of the service but making money for the artists in other areas you could see the artists moving there you know we haven't really seen people do a great job in the streaming services of activating acts off of the streaming side of things they're not selling a lot of merch for them they're not driving tickets they're not doing any of those things in any considerable numbers yet no one's really focused on those things yeah. So I think there's still there's still a lot of product innovation space around streaming that hasn't happened. We haven't yeah. seen it happen yet. We haven't broken out. We haven't broken out of certain places. So I'm you know I think the economic models and I, I actually had read her article, the uh, chief investment officer's um, interview with Billboard. I thought I read it with a little more um, maybe generosity than you did, Andrea. I, I thought she <laughs> was she was trying to say, look, we're trying to do something different. We're not there yet. The fact that they got you know the, all those artist managers in the room to talk is amazing to me because those guys are the hardest to get to do anything. Yeah, you know, and that's it. That's a that's a shift. Those guys haven't been at the table before. I we you know there are five people who are generally in the conversations around when a streaming service launches. You know, it's it's the heads of the digital services for the major labels. Sometimes you get someone from the AIM circle in or one of the indie big indies who get brought to the table, yeah. and they set the pace. Right? They set the they set the features. They set everything in a in a meeting. What's shifting in this case is what happens if Jack White decides to do something. What happens if JC and they're and they're doing it at the business plan level, business model level. That could be really interesting. So again, I'm I'm trying to be generous on all this because I just don't know what's going to happen. And I, I think you can go back to that United Artists thing in the in the 20s when Charlie Chaplin and, and those guys got together and said, we want to do something different. I do hope to see it go back to more changing how production happens yeah. around what the product they sell, how do they get packaged, and they don't really touch on that yet. And maybe mm -hmm. I'm just being too optimistic that they're going to go there, but that's where the greatest potential for innovation is going to be. Yeah. Not, not yet another streaming service. We don't need that. We need something different. Yeah, and and you touched uh, on on the effect of sort of independence, uh, larger independence having more of a say on, on what's going on. And uh, one of the things that we saw this week as well was uh, uh, the announcement that Concord Music Group and Bicycle Music yeah. have merged, they're for forming the Concord Bicycle Music uh, Group essentially. So the new entity includes uh, fifty five thousand copyright works and over seven hundred and fifty Billboard chart hits. Uh, and uh, they also announced raising a hundred million dollars uh, and uh, uh, also acquired uh, the labels Vanguard and Sugar Hill from the Val. 
Rock Music Group. So a big announcement here from uh, uh, you know Concord and Bicycle Music uh, uh, that will give them a lot more leverage when it comes to making deals. Uh, uh, Darren, do you think that we're going to see more of these uh, mega indie mergers to as indies that try to get more leverage in the marketplace as to what kind of deals they can do and and, and how the, uh, what kind of foot, footprint they have really with with services and with with partners? Yes, I think so, and I think that you know you're seeing more of that kind of thing unfolding is that you know there's a sort of strength in numbers aspect coming together here which is it's just a natural development in the marketplace really isn't it that you know those smaller entities that will feel like their positions are threatened you know uh, it's a it's a much stronger play for survival if they join forces so it, to me this feels like a fairly simple strategy you know yeah. in, in terms of consolidating in order to to survive you know um but yeah i think whether it's larger players in the game snapping up the smaller fish you know because they can and it provides the smaller fish with you know a continued existence of some description or you're seeing the sort of mid-level type entities merging to to hold a stronger uh, suit against the, the the bigger people you know it's yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's a fair bit has already happened but i i feel it's probably still the thin end of the wedge and we'll get quite a lot more yet yeah. yeah, and I guess like I'm, I'm, I'm not that, uh, you know, informed around sort of mergers of and and uh, you know acquisitions of labels. But I was wondering if either of you knows whether on on when it comes to, obviously when it comes to catalog like this, you know, you have hundreds of Billboard hits, you have all these you know sort of historical uh, uh, works that work uh, in the marketplace, and so that they, they know they're going to make money off that in in the long run. Uh, when it comes to new labels, obviously uh, at one point there were a lot of merger uh, acquisitions of smaller labels that uh, found artists and stuff what is happening today have, have you seen a lot of uh, smaller labels being snapped up by majors is there less of that now because everything is going by distribution deals and has has that kind of a dynamic change a little bit I, don't know if I mean from from my side certainly you're seeing you know bmg for one have been shopping around for you know uh, the right kind of labels to to pick up you know and yeah some, you know, I think it is some of its catalogue and maybe others are, are for, for different reasons. I don't know, you know, but um, yeah, it's you're, you're certainly seeing, you know, the, I mean, they're, I think because they're a bigger player in the game, they tend to get more press when they do buy anything, you know, so it tends to be that as with most of these things, their every move is probably watched a bit more than uh, yeah. perhaps the mid-level tiers. But, you know, they, they certainly they have been busy um, and I, I, I see no reason why that would stop at this particular point because it's a uh, you know it, it is i mean in their case it, it feels like the majority of it is more catalog focused with what they've been purchasing but yeah. um you know and as i said it, it kind of makes a lot of sense you know then i think bmg have probably got a reasonably clear sort of mandate that they want to compete with the majors you know they have the, the three majors in their sites rather than uh the, the 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 smaller indies or whatever so with that in mind it would it would seem the strategy makes a lot of sense so um so yeah, I mean, as I said, I, I just have a gut feeling that it's something we'll see more and more of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really hope to see the uh, the, the guys like Concord and Bicycle become more like Cobalt and BMG, more yeah. label services and rights holders organizations. What the big three have always had is is they were primarily distribution companies, right? They were that was their that was their legacy and their history and their challenges, right? Is that they're still and they're still digging out from the rubble. They're mm. just still picking up those pieces. The thing that Darren mentioned earlier about just not taking YouTube to task for, you know, you got the right hand side giving it away and the and the business side saying pull it back. That's a major label problem. The rights groups don't seem to have that problem. They don't make those mistakes in the same level, right? They aren't because yeah. they're because they're they're marketing organizations, they're mostly marketing organizations. Their metrics are around, you know, are we are we charting this? Are we doing this? Are we doing these services for our artists? And the major labels still have a very messy metrics for are they successful or not? You've got big departments who have different, conflicting goals. Yeah. It's one of the biggest problems I see with the big guys still. I mean, it's amazing. That's I think that's why we still have the YouTube problem that Darren described. And it's interesting you talk about technology and cobalt, like. At what point do you think that labels that are becoming of this size, you know, significant and taking significant investments should invest in technology themselves? Or should they rely on third parties like Cobalt to develop the technology that then they can use? Or is that is that a dangerous strategy? I, I would be careful. I mean, look, I, I sat inside technology teams at the big labels on a couple of them watch, and I watched the speed at which we could move. And I, I do believe Cobalt can move quickly. 
I think some of the services that they're hyping as their own technology are maybe a little overstated. They've got amazing technology. don't know that they do. That's not their strong suit. They've got some good people, but it's not necessarily they're the most. What they do have is, a, is, a, is an understanding of how the industry works and an industry of how to serve their artists. Yeah. And whatever serves your artist best, you own technology, rented technology, or you know, just let's outsource it to somebody else. All those things, those are decisions that a good business should be able to make. And you shouldn't have to have it inside. I don't think these guys have to be building their own technology. They have to have people who can execute well for their artists. And if they can do that with rented technology or bought technology or, you know, whichever, or, or, or own developed, they should take those decisions one at a time. What I do hope to see is the indies focus more on label services and artist services. Yeah. <laughs> That's the natural place for them to go. It's the natural place that people like Darren's organization does. And it's certainly a strength. And have really good players in your organization who know when to use a small indie and when to use the big guns. Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely, that makes sense. And uh, uh, you know, moving on, I guess uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, mention, uh, sticking with sort of services, the services side of things, is that Omniphone unveiled uh, sort of a new platform uh, for the B 2 B side of things uh, uh, called Music Station, which was created. They essentially recreated it from the ground up in order for it to be entirely uh, based uh, in the cloud and offer more scalable developments for, for for their clients. And one of the interesting things is that they partner with uh, Samsung and, and obviously uh, for their Milk Music service. And obviously, the listeners of DMT will. Uh, remember probably that Samsung's Milk service uh, is uh, uh, powered by uh, uh, Slacker Radio in the US. Uh, so uh, I was kind of interested to see uh, how that came about. But obviously Slacker is a US only service, so it made sense for uh, Samsung to find a third party partner uh, whilst the Slacker probably wasn't uh, too keen on getting licenses for the world just to satisfy Samsung's demand. And, and so uh, uh, obviously Omniphone has a lot of licenses around the world and uh, they are starting this out in the, with New Zealand and Australia. So they're going to power the Milk music service uh, uh, through music station uh, um, from Omniphone and also sort of use some of their in-house curation services uh, to uh, help uh, um, with that uh, service as well. Uh, Milk Music will still use the dial app that uh, a lot of the US listeners uh, might be uh, used to if they are users of the service or, or, or either have checked it out uh, over the last few months. Uh, uh, and so uh, an interesting dynamic here. Uh, uh, it'd be interesting to see whether Omniphone can uh, pull this off on a more international scale because obviously they lost a couple of huge clients in, in Uh, Sony Music Unlimited and, and BlackBerry's BBM Music over the last year, and so uh, this could be a big coup for them if, if they could pull it off. Do, do you think that Milk ha has a chance to scale? I have, to be, I have to actually excuse myself from this one since I'm a little too close to it and a little yes, too much on the inside. Sorry, but I will, yeah, yeah, I will yeah. say um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my mother used to say, "If you can't say something nice, be careful what you say." Yes, yes. <laughs> and that's all. I'm going to leave it right there. Yeah, I mean, I'm. Um, I, don't, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I don't feel I know enough about it to really make a, uh, a, a valuable contribution. I just, I just have a sort of general scepticism. I feel like, I don't know, it's, it's difficult to describe, but it, you, you get companies that very much specialize on these things, and then you get companies that sort of feel like they're uh, attaching on a, a service because at some point a, a team has told them that's the thing to do. Yeah. And, you know... Whilst someone could probably put their hand up and say, yeah, but what about Apple and iTunes? I mean, you know, and that's a, a good example of when it's been done right. But it, it just feels like you get those other people where, you know, PlayStation tried it with their service and it kind of failed and they've now just used Spotify and Xbox are having a good go with their music service. But I, you know, I just feel it's inevitable that they will probably go the same way as, as Sony did with PlayStation. And, and it's the same sort of thing around Samsung and Milk. I just... I don't know. There's just something about it that doesn't it doesn't ring true for me. But then equally, I think there's, you know, it's always easy to be dismissive of these things. And I think when Omniphone kind of lost the, the PlayStation thing and, and you know, deal and, and all that kind of stuff, there was a lot of, of, you know, chatter that that was it for them and how could they possibly compete with Spotify and things like that. But it really depends on the basis on which you're judging this stuff isn't it yeah. for once it's a big world there's a lot of territories where these things can go in and dominate where spotify hasn't launched yet or yeah. you know there's all manner of things like that and equally it may be that you know success is gauged by different things you know and if this is a semi loss leading service that just helps sell phones and and things like that kind of in a similar manner to to how apple have positioned things for them maybe then um then it could prove to be a, a profitable venture of some description, you know, yeah. within their world, it might be worth doing. Uh, Absolutely. So, but, you know, as I said, I must confess to not 
having enough knowledge about it to really pass comment beyond that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it feels like people like the interface of Milk. It, it, uh, it just as an interface, uh, as we know, you know, all the services are quite similar, and so uh, just the fact that they managed to come up with something that people are interested in playing around with is is a good thing. Uh, but it, it does become messy when you start having different companies uh, building on the same service probably providing a different type of experience in different territories and then how do you sort of aggregate that and how do you make that cohesive it's it's a whole other matter so we'll see, we'll see how that progresses uh, over the next uh, year or so uh, I just read the Hypebot posted uh, uh, the Webby nominees the Webby award nominees for music categories and in the mobile sites apps and apps uh, music uh, category SoundCloud Vivo Sound of Sidra which I never heard of uh, Sat, JF14 and Pandora were nominated and in the best streaming audio mobile sites and apps uh, you see SoundCloud app beat Music, audio, uh, Y and Y C, uh, W N Y C uh, app, and iHeartRadio. Uh, so uh, interesting there. Uh, some uh, some that Ooh. I expected to be there, and some I didn't expect to be there. So uh, there you go. That is the, that is that. And finally, I just wanted to touch upon uh, live. So uh, one, uh, one of the th- stories that came up this week was the fact uh, uh, that uh, uh, there was a, a pretty big uh, haul of uh, uh, sixty-two million dollars uh, from uh, Seed Geek uh, and the. Tech Crunch reports that sort of the Atlantic sales uh, startup uh, uh, raised this uh, Series C funding to to expand in, in a variety of ways. Uh, uh, they've uh, already raised 103 million dollars, so a huge amount of money. Uh, you know, one of their key competitors is StubHub, uh, but SeatGeek has a partner with a bunch of different services. They had a, uh, had a partnership with the Spotify, Audio, and Last uh, in, in order to integrate that that kind of sales side uh, in, into the platforms. Uh, it seems like ticketing is still a very hot. Uh, a place to be for 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 a company, even a company that is kind of virgin between being a startup and being a sort of a grown-up company with this kind of funding. Uh, how do you feel like this can progress, uh, uh, Darren? Do you think that you know this is a great space to be in at the moment? It looks like, but there's still so much divergence between what's going on on sort of the marketing side and, and what's going on, on the live side, and it seems like nobody can solve that riddle of how to bring those two together so you can actually create more cohesive experiences for, for consumers and even Spotify hasn't really quite managed it yet. Do you think that we'll see uh, s- s- companies become more successful at, at it over the next year? I don't know really. I mean, I, I think part of the problem is is just this issue that there are so many stakeholders involved that trying to get them all to to play nice um, is incredibly hard. And, you know, and it's only the same issues we see around sort of copyright and rights payouts and, you know, royalties and all those sorts of things in music, whether it's such a uh, an unbelievable mess of people involved and everything else that it, it um, is just incredibly tricky to make progress on certain levels. I mean, certainly, you know, the songwriters element that we're seeing around sort of Spotify and YouTube is a case in point yeah. where it, it would appear that they are uh, considerably worse off than uh, than the labels and the copyright owners, if you like, uh, uh, you know, the, the recorded music owners, I should say. So um, I don't know. I mean, really, I, I think it is complicated, and it's whether there'll be enough give uh, from all parties involved for something truly kind of, you know, for, for proper uh, consolidation and innovation to come through that will make this, you know, roll this all up into something that's much more kind of easy to to innovate and sell yeah yeah and um, matthew you've also worked with, on, with a bunch of companies in in the past where you were sort of uh, have you had uh, ticketing integrations but yeah. uh, you know things never worked quite quite as uh, as one would, would hope so uh, you know is that the the promoter's fault the t- you know the the seller's fault yeah, who's yeah whose fault is it, whose um, fault is it? <laughs> i don't i don't view it as a, as a fault problem i think it's it, one of the reasons this is a space of why people are investing is there's still consumers who are unhappy with the experiences they're getting right this is an area when there is lots of improvement to be made on a what is a sub a suboptimal experience for most people in, in terms of buying tickets and getting their tickets delivered um, you also hear the artists complain about it, artist managers complain about it when I was at Samsung we were working on a project that was was really trying to help break this problem you know and so it's a lot of people in the space so um, glad to see someone challenging the big guys the the live nations and the AGs of the world that it just it's good to get that out there yeah um, and I'm happy to see someone making the challenge I it's interesting that they're sitting at that intersection between sports and music because yeah. this isn't just a music problem. This is clearly a sports and music come together, and there's so much money involved. I think that's why you're seeing the valuation being as high as it is. If it was just a music problem, I think the numbers would be much lower. But this is a sports problem too. Yeah, you know, Absolutely. the secondary market is a secondary ticketing market is something that you hear a lot of people complain about, right? It's it's not an ideal space for the artists and the fans, right? So 
there, there's a lot of work to be done in this space, and I think someone figuring out how to do it, and hopefully this extra money they just got will give them some boost. Um, but it's also really a local business still. I think that's one of the challenges you guys have to go from being a uh, – it's very clear, I think, in the States how it works, a little clear in the UK. But once you get outside the major three markets for this stuff, you just enter a really um, medieval – kind of style of yeah. business arrangements you have with with promoters and who owns the ticketing and what per- percentage they do it's, it's it requires a very flexible system yeah to yeah. solve those problems absolutely and also this week i had a chat with uh, catch up with the guys at smule to talk about what's been going on at the company and so here is an extract of the interview that uh, we recorded uh, around uh, their latest developments especially talking about uh, their work with artists it's a real pleasure to be here with uh, uh, Jeannie Yang and uh, uh, Turner Kirk. Uh, so uh, Turner is the Artist Relations Manager at Smule and uh, Jeannie is the Chief Product and Design Officer at the company. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you back. When we first spoke, uh, your uh, artist program was kind of uh, just at the beginning in terms of like getting uh, more independent artists or, or smaller artists uh, to, to join the platform. And so we have to lot, a lot to talk about there. Uh, you, you touched upon, upon T-Pain first. So uh, let's talk about that. The continuation of that collaboration, uh, first of all, and so uh, uh, I understand that you have been con- you continue to work with uh, with him uh, on, on a variety of things, and, and the last uh, thing that happened was the unveiling of his new single uh, hashtag on a, on a video. So uh, Turner, how did that come about, and how do you come up with new ways of sort of interacting with his fan base uh, 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 on on the same platform? Yeah, well, T- I mean, T Pain is a very special case, of course, um, because we have such an awesome relationship with him, and he was pretty much well, he was the first uh, Smule artist back in right. 2009 when we did the T Pain app with him. But uh, I mean, in the in that time, he's he's proven to be an incredibly uh, strong force and musical force in the pop world, and uh, and continued to evolve and had his share of issues, of course, but he's back full full throttle and uh he just released his mixtape um last week uh on datpiff.com uh and so we were basically it was really good timing uh first of all because we wanted to do this uh this big thing called Smule Fest yeah. which he ended up headlining and uh second of all because he was releasing his <laughs> he happened to be releasing his uh mixtape on the exact same day that we were doing that right. uh, which was great so um it was a pretty natural uh again connection between us um i ended up flying out to atlanta um to help him to make sure that the recording and everything on the phone went went well because he was really yeah. really busy still <laughs> finishing up his mixtape yeah um but yeah it was it was pretty easy it was uh it was amazing how how quick that all came together his yeah. team is really really amazing that's awesome. And so uh, talking about uh, the way that, you know, for example, Sing, uh, the way that different bands are, are interacting with that kind of application. So how, how do you see, uh, obviously, different fan bases interact with a similar application? That's quite an interesting thing to look at. If you look at, like, a Small Pools, another band that you worked with, uh, uh, they've also done some work on, on, on Sing. And, and how that does that interaction of the fans differ from the, the fans of T-Pain, which are, are very different uh, sort of types, I would imagine? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, the song has has something to do with it too, and and people's familiarity with it. So yeah, uh, it, I mean, there's there's a lot of different ways people interact uh, in terms of numbers, I guess. Like, are there a lot of people performing the song, or not? Not a lot of people, or are they on Android? Are they on iOS? Yeah. Um, but uh, with T Pain, for example, we had a lot more people on Android, which was interesting. Um, I mean, I guess is that if that's kind of what you're wondering about. Um, but generally, yeah, no, absolutely. That, the, that, that was sort of a of, component. Oh, sorry, what? No, absolutely. That was sort of a component to see like where people are and w- what do they do with it. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, generally, uh, a lot of uh, the audio only duets uh, that people sing with with the artists. It's harder harder to tell where they are, what they're doing. Yeah. But you can get an idea just by watching the videos that people make with these artists of kind of the uh, demographics that are that are joining them, or uh, what you know, how how old people are, how uh, what where they're from. Uh, you can kind of see where they are on a map, um, and I mean, it, it's it's kind of what you would expect. A lot of yeah. a lot of artists, it's their their demographic that that we're seeing uh, the most vocal about. But I think the coolest thing to me is seeing on their Facebook 
uh, walls or or on their other social media sites where people are are just by themselves posting, hey, look, I made this duet with you. Check it out. Maybe right. comment on it or something like that. And then also, of course, seeing the the comment feed on on their duet open calls where people can go in and just be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm singing with this artist. And uh, I mean, for the bigger name artists like T Pain, of course, that's uh, that's a a much uh, that happens a lot more. Um, but then for the smaller artists, it's cool because you see people being like, wow, you're an amazing singer. I've never heard of this band. This is great. Right. Um, this is really cool. So, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different ways that people kind of come in and interact. And, and then where they go afterwards is interesting, too. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and but, uh, I guess, yeah. like Jeannie, for, for, I'd like to bring you in on that. So when it comes to uh, over the last six months, obviously you had a lot of experience with different types of bands and artists uh, working with this platform. Uh, when it comes to actually uh, adapting uh, or, or, or you know responding to some of their requests, when it comes to uh, how the product functions or is, is, uh, visualizes the, the songs, uh, have you made uh, any changes or is there anything interesting that came out uh, or, or, over the last six months? Yeah, actually, uh, maybe Turner alluded to it. I don't. I believe when we talked to you, we haven't released it yet, but one of the major things we released, we released video in our same product. So people could record, before it was just audio, so when you join, you see it's more of a static album art, you hear the two voices, but now with video, it has really changed because people go, wow, that's the artist that I'm singing with. And so that was a major thing that we did. We allow users to um, record a video and we do all the mastering and transition as well of the video. So before wow. we we're doing, so on top of doing the audio rendering and mixing, we now take those audio signals and use that to mix the video. So you have sort of oh, an nice. interplay. So you have this video transition between T Ping and you, and he'll slide in, he'll, and you'll sli- and he'll slide out, and you'll slide in, or the two of you will be seen together based on the audio signals that we're detecting from the two tracks and then we'll do the transitions on top of it so that has been a a major feature on it i think for the artists as well now it's not just their voices so the you for them there and this is turner had to fly out to to get t-fan because he's really busy to yeah. he's recording it but now for our fans it's like oh yeah that's for real he's actually in his home studio doing that and you see t-pain walking around kind of like, hey here i am <laughs> seeing with it and that's been a fantastic engagement and now as turner says people are sharing that because it's their faces with T-Pain singing together next to each other, not just an audio track. And I think that's been pretty significant. We definitely still have people joining audio. So we allow both, right? So yeah. we don't force you to do video. We don't have to. You can still just sing with T-Pain <laughs> on audio. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but um, that has been one of the, I think, major things that caused engagement and really changed. Yeah, and, and for the artists as well, I think. I know, so it's you know, it's, uh, you know obviously it kind of feels like a natural progression just because also of the, how, how much people are engaging with videos these days and it seems like a, a, since the technology allows that to happen now and, and the phones can process all that stuff uh, relatively, right. relatively easily uh, these days then, then it, it seems like a, a no-brainer it makes a lot of sense uh, uh, Turner, uh, talking about acts that you've worked with on the video side of things uh, uh, you work with the Wombats as well from, from the UK so h- how do these collaborations come about uh, do artists mainly come to you now or do you still reach out um, yeah it's I mean it, it's a very uh, sort of Usually, very organic thing. Um, usually, the artists themselves have either we we will get in contact with them or their their management or their yeah. label. Um, we have connections with uh, pretty much all major labels around, at least in the U.S. and, and a lot around the world as well. Um, so we're kind of uh, we're constantly in co- in contact with these labels, and then also we'll sometimes we'll just reach out to artist management artists who we think, oh, hey, this would be a really good one to work with. Um, The Wombats specifically, though, came to us through uh, a previous connection. um, And this is another really cool thing about the program is um, we can can take these kind of more independent artists um, that are a little bit smaller in reach and uh, do something great for them uh, on our platform. And then uh, in this case, again, uh, the, the Wombats were on the same label as this band flagship our first band that we really worked with um uh here in in the u.s their their label here is bright antenna in the u.s it's it's warner in the uk but uh that was the connection we had through them um the the head guy from bright antenna scott um connected us uh with with their people and it just it just worked out really well because they kind of already knew how it worked and uh 
the Wombats happen to be, again, they just happen to be on tour. They're kind of pre-tour before they're going on tour um, this spring. Uh, the, their pre-tour, they had to, happened to be in San Francisco, so I got to go sync up with them and nice. you know make sure things went well, make sure we got the best audio recording, and because they were re- they ended up recording it in uh, backstage at at a small venue here in San Francisco, which was really cool. Nice. <laughs> um, so the video, you can see the video. It's like wow, they're in this cool kind of indie rock space. It really fit their vibe, which was which was great. Um, it just happened to be the venue that they were playing at <laughs> that night. Um, but yeah, so there's connections come any any number of ways. But a lot of times it'll be through uh, the label or through previous connections that we have with with the artists. Um, and then of course there's times where we just reach directly out to artists because we think you'll be great for the, this platform and they either like it or or don't. Yeah, and, and Ginny, uh, obviously there's a huge potential on, on, on for internationalization and, and uh, the product is available around the world. But obviously the focus in terms of content right now is still on sort of uh, Western content. Uh, uh, what are your, th- your thoughts or plans around uh, sort of uh, an obvious expansion into, into getting acts like you know K-pop for example uh, to work on the platform and, and stuff like that because that that would seem like a no-brainer and also uh, huge audiences uh, sort of in Korea and, and all over the, all over Asia really for, for that kind of act yeah that's actually a great question because um, currently we have our uh, we have an internal content production team and they arrange the songs and we have relationships with over 600 publishers so it's really a matter of the production and getting the songs into it yeah. we've actually made a concerted focus to to push into k-pop area and actually have the licensing for the k-pop songs and ex- et cetera, and stuff like that. Awesome. In terms of international expansion, one of the things that we are looking at is how do we actually get our community and users to help out? And actually, beyond just the users singing the songs, they could also arrange the songs that they want to be singing as well. How do we open up the platform further and do that? So that's something that we're, we're testing with and playing with and seeing how to expand that. Because in order to do globally, for us as a small company, a start, startup, it'll be difficult for us to get every local music, for example, in yeah. not just in smaller countries, right? Like uh, Vietnam or like various countries that we may not have that local, but we actually have a user base there. Yeah. Or um, So another area, country that we're, that we are seeing growth in is actually Brazil. And so right. lately we've also been focusing on some content in Brazil as well, content production. But the, the longer term is we're, try- we're trying to figure out how we can actually open up the platform further to the users. Absolutely. And, and on the product front, I would also imagine that you're experiencing a, a, a shift in, in the user base, uh, you know, from, from iOS into Android and also a continued probably to see that iOS brings you the most money over Android as, as most, most people are saying. So, so I guess that's also like a challenge in the sense that you probably have a greater user base on Android, but it's probably making you less money than on iOS, right? Yes, we have. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of yes, like everybody, yes. every developer I know has, has that problem. So <laughs> That's the strong way of So I think the Android is giving us the reach, though. It's giving because of that. But, um, but in terms of where we are and in terms of bringing up the, the, the products, in terms of um, the, the features that they could support, because it's different platforms and they have different limitations. And that's for us on, on Android, one of the, the limitations that we are continuing to push on is just the audio latency of right. um, singing and recording. And so continue to push on that. Yeah, but, and Apple Apple has been, a thing, uh, as, for, for, as much as you can say about Apple, but they have developed some really uh, great backend tools for audio management and also MIDI yeah. management and all sorts of different things. And so that, that I think gives your legs up when it comes to developing for, for that platform. Right. It does. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, I just wanted to touch upon sort of, uh, in, to a certain extent, uh, uh, you know, uh, Smule has been the, the lone wolf uh, in the audio, in the, in the music gaming uh, space for, for a few years uh, <laughs> because, uh, you know, a lot of companies have tried, many companies have failed. There's, there's a lot of, it's very difficult to get the licensing right, is what you guys are doing so well, to create a really a, an audience that can travel between different types of games, which is another thing that you've done really well. Uh, but finally, we're starting to see a few companies that are coming in and, and uh, hopefully expanding this area a little bit. You know, we've seen Zaya that launched last year, uh, uh, we got chosen, that has, has been launched in beta this week uh, potentially rock band uh, coming back uh, uh, with a cons- console based game with a, a, a bit more uh, sort of um, of, of the same you know, to a certain extent but hopefully uh, bringing it back to the to the roots and, and making people excited about it again so h- how do you feel about this do you think it's it's a good thing that we're seeing a, an evolution of the of the ecosystem and, and hopefully music gaming becoming a thing again other than you know just you guys because obviously it's the more there is i think the better for the ecosystem to a certain extent the turner oh yeah definitely Definitely. Uh, I mean, 
Well, we we try not to look at ourselves too much as a game, yep. although most things on uh, on uh, mobile devices are just kind of by default a game. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think I think I mean obviously we're excited ab- about any sort of music gaming experience that becomes popular on mobile devices, but there are a lot of big barriers, and it's still really hard to do that. Yeah. Um, I think the best example thus far of a music game has been My Singing Monsters. I've actually played that game a lot and spent about eight dollars. So they've 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 done well with me on that. But I think I think there's about to me it seems like there's kind of three main things that um, kind of need to nail it, and it's it's hard to get all these right. One, which you already mentioned, was the music industry provides yeah. a large barrier. If you want to have cool music that people actually want to interact with, you have to have relationships with the, the major labels, and you have to make sure you have good background tracks, and it costs money to license, uh, to license the music. And then kind of the second thing is um, you have to also operate in the game industry yeah. on mobile, which provides its own set of, of issues. I mean, freemium is kind of yeah. really the way to attract a lot of users. And so there's a disconnect between having a free game and having to pay licenses for money or for music, excuse me. Um, and it's everyone wants to access the content that they want for free. So you have to have a large catalog of music as well. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's why Rock Band kind of has done, has done well in the past. Uh, it's tougher on mobile, though, I think. Yeah. Um, and then there's also the, the Apple ecosystem where you can only uh, do in-app purchases. Well, so for games, they actually have, uh, they actually have a bit of an advantage because they can do virtual currency, whereas yeah. non-games um, aren't really allowed to. Um, but then there's also the third, third and most important thing to us, especially, I think, is that music is just innately social, yeah. and mobile is innately social. So if you don't really have that social element nailed, or if it's hard to with the the sort of experience that you've created, um, I mean, a lot of these games are kind of like become a star, rise to the top, and uh, you're playing against leaderboards and avatars and things, and it's a solo experience, but yeah. uh, kind of. Where we have excelled, and I think a really important thing for any music game to, to nail is is how do you how do you connect people together to play this game? Like My Singing Monster again has all three of those things, and they have a really interesting way of getting people to interact with each other yeah. um, through the game. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's hard I, to recreate. I hope that yeah, games like Zaya do well, and yeah, sorry, what was that? No, it's it's, it's hard to recreate that that kind of social element. That's that's the, the trickiest part, I guess, of, of any product development. And and uh, uh, Ginny, uh, finally uh, talking about product development, uh, do you have uh, any any uh, projects uh, uh, in the oven that obviously you probably <laughs> can't talk about explicitly? But but uh, are we going to see more in terms of game development for, from you guys over the next year? Oh well, yeah. So I mean, but just maybe to touch on the, the yeah, sure, question beforehand yeah. as well. I would say that I I'm particularly excited because. To see all these new entrants and to see that because I, I feel like it's validating the stuff that Smil has been doing. As you said, it's we've been lone wolf, and now it's like you see these pockets. For example, chosen it's this community of people to vote upon and to vote upon singing stars. And actually, we're we see that in our community. Our community groups do that on, on themselves. So now, in a way, we try to tell these stories, but it's a lot better when there's more people in the industry and we go, yeah. hey, this is what we're doing. This is and so. I think that's been fantastic to actually see all these components come up and it's it's validates a lot of what's happening on our community, on our platform and kind of furthers what we're doing. So this leads into the question of product development. We are looking to the areas of actually how do we actually deepen the social connections between people but to do more of these types of potentially programming aspects of things. Um, I can say actually I, I could just tease you with a, a major update sure. that we will have coming out uh, at the end of the um, May, early June, don't quote me on this, <laughs> this <laughs> is that actually one of the main things that we're actually pushing forward on is our video product. So right. currently when we launch video, you could do solo video and just duet video. But singing is not just, um, so singing is a group experience. So what yeah. we are working on right now is how do you do group video? And that's a really challenging technical problem because you have people all over the world uploading their video and now we have to render it together. We have to make sure however they're singing, we have hundreds of people joining a group song. How do we make sure that everybody gets their moment or their frame? And so our team has been doing a ton of audio tech. I, w- I was, I mean, I think there was one day when they came like, we could show eight frames a second. So if everybody appears for a second, you know, three minute song, we could have this many people. And so it's, so there's a lot of those challenges and it's, yeah. it's a different type of audio mixing that we have to think about because when you do video, because you see, for example, only 
three or four or six people on the screen. You want to hear those people more. Yeah. And then, so how do we blend all the voices, et cetera? So that's actually... Um, that's pretty exciting. It's pretty fun. I think that and it sounds um, it sounds insanely complicated. I mean, the, the amount of uh, 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 hassle it is to to organize my system so that I can get three or four people <laughs> uh, and mix them in real time and have the video work in real time is is and there's a, still a little bit of lag, uh, which I, I try to yeah. compensate for by sort of mixing each channel uh, of you guys is mixed separately and goes to a different output, right. so you don't hear yourselves and everything. You know, there's sort of a lot yep. of issues to be solved. Uh, but yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's amazing. Uh, and and we're trying to automate that. all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in every scenario so the user, there's noise on yeah. the mic or whatever yeah and yeah. uh so yeah. i think just one more thing i'd like to say is i think virtual reality coming out i mean yeah. becoming more of a, a popular thing is is going to make the music game space very interesting too Absolutely, so that, and I'm excited about that. We talked about that the last week on the show uh, uh, in the context of the Coachella video streaming and, and whether one day we won't have to attend the festival. We can just uh, uh, <laughs> put a VR headset well, on. Let's hope just, we still go to festivals. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, minus the mud. But the, uh, I don't know. I don't like mud. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> yeah. Maybe they'll just hand out galoshes or something. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, it was a pleasure having you on today, and uh, thanks so much for your time once again. Uh, go and check out Smule uh, and, and the latest games and collaborations. And obviously, to all the industry people that are listening to the show if you uh, are a label or a publisher and you are not working with them yet you should probably give them a ring and, and see if you can uh, get some of the, your tracks on, on, on the system and also a lot of artists listen to the show so if you, if you are a band uh, do uh, uh, also check out what the options are uh, on there uh, thanks uh, once again for your time and uh, uh, you know to close off actually uh, one, one thing that I totally forgot to talk about was the fact that uh, Apple's new streaming offering hasn't launched yet but already the EU seems to be investigating it so it's kind of a very strange situation here uh, that the reported by the Financial Times apparently some questionnaires have already gone out uh, to a number of digital music services and labels uh, where they essentially have to express uh, their experience uh, with negotiating uh, 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 the licenses for this new streaming service and, and figure out whether uh, its practices uh, are compliant with the sort of antitrust uh, uh, laws and, and sort of uh, regulations uh, of, of all sorts that are in place in Europe. Uh, I mean, th this is a fairly straightforward story. It's just the, the, the thing that is, is funny is that we, we saw, for example, Impala do a big complaint about YouTube when they uh, tried to exert pressure on making the deals for the music key service. Uh, but we haven't really seen anything come out of that. And it, it, I wonder whether that's just purely because Apple has a, a measurable market share of the recorded music market and it's something that the EU, EU can see, look, Apple's got X amount of the recorded music space today in terms of digital music sales. They might have be able to exercise uh, you know, undue pressure on, on these other companies in order to license the music. But at the same time, maybe YouTube doesn't generate the same amount of cash and so it doesn't undergo the same amount of scrutiny. It's kind of, it's, it's really strange. I'm, I'm trying to piece up piece together why uh, in my head uh, you know the, the same kind of scrutiny is not going into looking uh, at YouTube Music Key uh, as is already going into a service that Apple hasn't even announced yet uh, I, I don't know if you if you guys have any thoughts on that before we close I think really I mean from my side of it it was it was it struck me that there may be a I mean, I may have misunderstood it but I, I interpreted it as the concern was that Apple would um, abuse its position basically yeah. to, to get exclusives and to force that. And, and I think that's not something that someone like YouTube could necessarily do. I think because the point was that, you know, they still own the largest download store in the world. And, yeah. and I think the idea was that they would perhaps use that as the, you know, give us something exclusively on Beats or you won't be in the iTunes store or on Beats or whatever, you know, those sorts of things. And, and maybe that springs from a, concern around how apple has behaved in the past i don't know um you know it's 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 a little murky isn't it i mean as yeah. you said given, Google, given the service Google's already up against it right i mean they've already got their own antitrust stuff going on existing i think it's probably let's either let's not pile onto that one um mm. i they, they still haven't stopped looking at them for this stuff maybe yeah, it's just yeah. something that they will probably incorporate in their other antitrust it's possible that will already happen so yeah i wouldn't i would i'm actually personally much more worried about the way music key is used to leverage artists in YouTube than I am about Apple using this to leverage beats personally. But that's, thank God I don't yeah. have a, a, an artist I'm representing in that space. Yeah. No, I think it's interesting though, isn't it? In that, it, it, yeah, it, the, it feels like Apple's ability to 
force that would be increasingly challenged anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, the recent developments with Tidal would probably be the, the, the biggest competitor against that, just because when they've signed on so many of the bigger names, you know, they, they have much more of an ability to rock that boat than perhaps Spotify do. Um, I don't, maybe... You, you it's, might also see this as that this is something that's come out of the European Union to defend some of its own its own folks, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're looking at because the biggest people threatened by Apple's moves are European companies at this stage. Mm. I mean, Spotify. You may see them just saying, "Look, let's step into this and take a look." When it's yeah, I'm, so I'm just curious if that's been some of the. There's been some effort there in that, in that space. I don't see currently music he hasn't made the impact. It's not coming out with the same large push. Yeah. Yes, I'm, and we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll see what happens. Uh, you're absolutely right, Matthew. Uh, there was the same thing that I, I thought about was the fact that they were trying to also look look out a little bit for the European companies that are in the space, and and uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, which is something that uh, it is known to do because uh, uh, obviously both Spotify and Deezer are are uh, headquartered uh, to a certain extent in, in Europe or originate from Europe anyway. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, uh, let's talk about anything that what's going on on your end. So, uh, uh, Darren, anything you want to push or talk about or mention? or campaigns or anything really oh god um just too many to mention <laughs> too much <laughs> usual going thing where, yeah i mean <laughs> you know there's so many things we have going on now that uh you know trying to trying to pull any one of them out to push is uh, <laughs> is is tricky yes uh, so um no not really i mean uh, you know just visit motiveunknown.com and you'll probably see a bunch of the stuff we're working on but it's uh it's all good you know it's all very interesting and it's uh it's it's pretty 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 busy at the moment yeah, absolutely, all, yeah. Yeah. And, and also subscribe to the daily digest uh, if you haven't it's a great newsletter that Darren puts out just in case you haven't uh, I'm sure most of my listeners will have it at this point surely surely <laughs> and uh, Matthew what about uh, what about you anything that you want to talk about your end just a, just a shout out to my boys at uh, Soundwave who've been on a roll internally they haven't shown a lot of this stuff hasn't shown up in the app yet but I'm excited right. by some of the beta stuff I've been seeing um, glad to see those guys working so hard and, uh, and, and and putting in a renewed push at getting their product market fit down because awesome. they've got such good momentum with the art with the with people they've got and good support from the stores to see their product uh, mature a little bit has been kind of exciting I'm hoping to see that get shared with more people soon awesome I'm excited uh, I, I need to catch up with Brandon soon as well uh, well yeah. uh, that's great and uh, thanks so much for listening today Digital Music Trends comes out every week you can find it on digitalmusictrends.com uh, have a fantastic week and until uh, next time 